also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, here's the qualifier, sharing his spiritual blessing and inheritance, if indeed we share in his suffering so that we may also share in his glory. Now, of course, if we look at it in the message, it breaks it down even more and it says, this resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. Now, sure, we get the gist of this. We've read the scripture. We're familiar with it. We get the gist. Our benediction even states what? Wherever you are, God is. We say this after every service. So we get this, but... I submit to you that we think of the Most High God as sub sovereign and we reverence him as we should. We're supposed to do that. But we forget that we were created to fellowship with him. We do not truly imagine ourselves with him sometimes, I think, dwelling among us so intimately that he responds to our every thought, our every concern. You see, it is one thing to say it, but it's quite another thing to live it like we do understand that. So when we do the latter, we do not see ourselves as guests at the banquet table. Rather, we see ourselves like you probably do on Thanksgiving when you go to mama and them's house, okay? <laughs> Where you pull up a chair, take your shoes off, especially after you've eaten a little bit. You get comfortable and you dine until you are full, wanting nothing. You know, and if you're like my family, you have to take a break before you can even think about dessert because you're so full. Now, as a result of being so comfortable, we sit around the table and you don't just sit there in silence. What do you do? You sit there and you talk, you fellowship. Well, when you're sitting at the master's table and you're comfortable, you should be doing the same thing. You see, when we do that, we start a conversation where we listen to what he is saying. We are entering into true fellowship and see our joint heirs as our friends, as our family not just some faraway people that we look forward to seeing later on by and by, okay? Of course, yes, we look forward to the return of Jesus, our someday king. But I submit to you that once you become comfortable and truly fellowship with God, our Father, and Jesus, our Lord and Savior, as well as our high priest, and the Holy Spirit who is currently working things out on our behalf, you have no choice but to apply the word to your life because it will become just that familiar to you. Have you ever spent time with someone, any amount of time with somebody, it could be a friend, it could be a loved one, and you spend some you know, time with them, quality time, and without realizing it, you start to pick up some of their sayings? You know, you, you don't even realize it. You start to pick up some of their sayings. Or perhaps you may have gone to a foreign country where you didn't really know the language and you really weren't familiar with the dialect, but you stay there for a little while and you start picking up some of the phraseology. And, you know, if you're like some people, you may go and start picking up the dialect. It just naturally seems to, through osmosis, you just pick it up. Well, guess what? When you're sitting at the master's table, and you're fellowshipping with him, that's exactly what happens. The word becomes who you are. Out of the abundance of your heart, the word flows through you because that's what you know. That's what you become familiar with. You see, we so often have looked at, we're here, we love God, there's no question about that. We know the word is, is 
supposed to be the final authority in our lives. We know all that. But when I say we're sitting at the banquet table and sometimes we grab a snack when we need it, we'll sit there. We know the word is real. We know the importance of it. But at the same token, it's like we are so busy. And you got to understand that busyness is designed by the enemy. That's what his job is. The only way that he can get to you is through thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. That's it. He does not have any authority in your life. But if he can get you so busy that you are running back and forth, you're trying to work overtime because you can't figure out how to get enough money to be able to pay the bills that seem to be mounting higher and higher. And it seems like there's always something else to get your attention. It could be something that's happened in your life or something you're just trying to help people with. You may have children that you're trying to help go to school and you're trying to figure out how are you going to get the extra money for tuition. So, okay, I know I'll take on an extra job because if I do that, then that will help with that. Never considering you're sitting at the master's table. There is a banquet before you. He never told you to go get another job. He told you what? That he would meet every need according to what? His riches in glory through Christ Jesus. You don't need to go get the other job. You're sitting at the banquet table. Or something else will come. You get a little pain. Something happens. Oh, I'm going to stop by the banquet table. I'll grab a little snack because, of course, he said that he would take care of any kind of pain that I have because by the stripes of Jesus, I've already been healed. I'll grab a little snack about that. Okay, that's not why he prepared the banquet. He wants us to have that full, comfortable feeling. The same way you can imagine when you sit there at Thanksgiving with all your family and friends. You're real comfortable. He wants you to be that comfortable with him. That's what he wants. He created us to fellowship with him. Not just to go seek what's in his hands to give us, but to seek his face to really fellowship with him. He loves you more than you are capable of comprehending. And you need to understand that. And that's what I want to get across to you today. That's why I'm not up there. I don't want to be up there. I want you to really get what's in my heart. Because if you do that, that puts you one step closer to coming to sit at that table. So, <laughs> today, I want you to take God off the cloud that he is sitting on in your mind and sit right next to him at that banquet table. Then I want you to go a step further and think about the things that he has done in your life that only he could have done. You know those only but God moments? We all have had some if we've lived here a while, okay? I want you to reflect on that. Then I want you to become genuinely aware of his presence. He is always orchestrating things on your behalf because he loves you just that much. And see, we, can, we have to guard our hearts because we can almost become desensitized because we're so busy trying to do things ourselves that we don't realize his presence. We don't really practice his presence. And we need to start doing that. Now, think about this for a moment. If you were standing in a crowded room and someone you care about deeply enters into the room, you want them to know that you see them but you can't physically touch them. There's too much distance, you can't. On top of that, you may be engrossed in a conversation or perhaps you're giving a lecture or teaching a lesson, okay? But you want them to know that you see them. What can you do that is subtle? You can give them a wink, okay? Then they recognize that you saw them, okay? Well, guess what? God does what I consider giving winks to us all the time, but we don't really notice. Now, I don't mean things like he allows us to see the flowers bloom every spring, which is beautiful, 
or appreciate the beauty of snow on Christmas Day. You know I had to get Christmas in here, right? <laughs> okay. I am referencing the more intimate times or the more intimate things in our lives. As I mentioned earlier, we can learn experientially through others' lives. I cannot talk about you, so I'm willing to share my life with you. First, let me say this. It is not easy standing before you bearing <laughs> all the things that I intend to share. In the natural, it can be very uncomfortable because I am very imperfect and have made a whole lot of mistakes, <laughs> but I am willing to share whatever I can if it's gonna help somebody else. If nothing else, I'll just do whatever I can if it's gonna encourage you to know that God loves you and is moving heaven and earth for your benefit, no matter what it may seem like at this moment. Now, we all know, because you've heard my story before, I grew up in church, I always had a love for God, ever since I was a little child. However, I did go to a Baptist church where, at my particular Baptist church, and I'm not saying this is all Baptist churches, so don't get mad with me, okay? My church, they had this big, beautiful Bible, they set it up there on the you know, podium, the pastor read one little verse, stuck it underneath the podium, and then he went about doing his little show, okay? That was kind of like uh, what he did. I went there, I didn't know any better, I went there from the time I was a little child, okay? I joined the church, thought I was saved, and this is key, because this always gets to me. There are a lot of people in churches all over America who believe in their heart that they are born again. They believe it. I would have wrestled you down to the ground believing that I was born again, and I was grown, married, had three children, and I can tell you unequivocally, I was going to hell in a handbasket because I was not saved, but I thought that I was. But you see, the church that I went to, like I said, they didn't open the Bibles. They never told me anything about Romans 10, 9, and 10. I never knew anything about that. But I joined the church, filled out my little card, okay, joined the choir, joined the usher board, did all the stuff they told me to do, served at every, every single service. I was in church all the time. I really believed I was saved, but I was not, okay? So, praise the Lord, I found out, somebody called and told me about Dr. Price being on TV. So I turned on the channel, and how he got me, where I just couldn't believe it, was he talked about the last enemy to be destroyed was death. And my mother had passed away when I was 15 years old, and I was one of these people who, of course, I had no authority in my prayer. I never signed it off with Jesus' name because I went to the Baptist church that never taught me that. I didn't know how to pray, but I didn't know that either. But I knew that I had asked God to take care of my mother, and I felt like he didn't. I felt like he failed me, and I got to tell you, I was one angry human being when it came to God. So when I heard Dr. Price say that, and then I went and ran and got my Bible and looked in Corinthians and saw it for myself. I was like, wait a minute. So God didn't take my mother. He did not kill her. This is an enemy who did it. Oh, wait a minute. This changed the whole entire dynamic for me. So every time he was on TV, guess where I was? That's where I was, feeding upon that word. Then I found out that he was going to have crusades. So we went to the first two crusades that were in the Meadowlands in New Jersey. Okay, so we would pack up the kids, we would go to the crusades, and you've heard me tell the story, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but at the time we were so without funds, poor, whatever you want to call it, I could not even afford to buy those little mini books. I think we sell them for a dollar and a quarter or something at the time. They were 75 cents. I didn't have the 75 cents. So I would stand there at the book table and read as fast as I could because I wanted to find out what these books said. I did that. Then he came to Long Island and I was like, great. I knew I wanted to be filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit, evidenced by speaking with other tongues, because that was the next step. Keep in mind, I still wasn't saved. Didn't know that though, okay? But I knew I wanted the Holy Spirit. So I knew we were going to this crusade. I had it all planned out. I knew, okay, I'm gonna answer the altar call. All right, we get to the last night. 
We get out of the car, I'll never forget this stand, the things this man puts up with me. So we get out of the car and I get out and I say to him, look, I'm gonna do something, you're not gonna understand what I'm gonna do, I don't care, I love Jesus, I'm gonna do it. The man is looking at me like, what are you talking about? Because you gotta understand, and this is why to this day, altar calls are so important to me. I don't care where I go, an altar call is sacred because there's somebody during that altar call who's sitting like I was sitting, who is sitting and they're afraid. Because you see, Stan grew up in church. I did not, okay? I mean, I grew up, but not like he, he grew up reading the word, they took Bibles to church. He can tell you all about the people in the Old Testament. I found this stuff out after 1984, okay? I was grown, I did not know any of this because like I told you, they stuck the Bible underneath. So anyway, the point being is, I wanted to answer the altar call to be filled with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It just so happened. See how God is working behind the scenes when we don't even know it. We got a seat on the front row in this auditorium. We have been going all week sitting up there somewhere. They put us on the front row. So when the altar call came, all I had to do was close my eyes because I was, I was not going to look at Stan. Are you kidding? Because he came from the Brethren Church where they didn't believe in speaking in tongues. They believed if you spoke in tongues, it was of the devil and it was horrible. And I'm thinking because, again, remember what I said to you earlier about how the enemy can only get to us through what? Thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. So he's giving me this thought, idea, and suggestion. If you answer that altar call and if you are filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit, his family is going to disown you. They're going to take their ki your kids away from you. You are going to get a divorce. All of this. Now, it didn't even make logical sense. But if you constantly have somebody feeding you that, faith cometh by hearing. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. So therefore, I started thinking, oh my gosh, Lord, I might lose everything. But I love you. I'm willing to do it. So I remember answering the altar call and I stepped out. I never opened my eyes. I was so glad. That's why we're sitting on the front row and the stage was right there. I just stepped out, never opened my eyes. And, you know, Dr. Price prayed and everything. He told us to turn around and go to the prayer room. When I turned around, who was standing there but Stan? That was my first wink that I knew from God because that let me know no matter what I've got you so of course the rest is history in the sense that again this ministry is so excellent that when I went to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit they minister salvation first why because the gift of the Holy Spirit is only available to believers and it was at that point that I realized oh my gosh I am not saved so I was born again that night, spirit filled that night, and the rest of my life totally, totally changed. Praise God. Because I was so excited to know that I was a daughter of the king. Oh my goodness. Now, what happened after that? We listened, the whole family, we listened to Dr. Price every single week. And we started applying the word immediately. We applied the word immediately because we, that's all we knew. We didn't know to do anything different. We didn't have all of this. We weren't sitting up trying to analyze things. You know, sometimes, and you gotta be careful of this, because sometimes you can be so smart that you hurt yourself. Because you can be so smart, were you trying to analyze everything? We didn't do that. I was like, God loves me, he accepted me, I am his daughter, I am royalty, that's all I need to know. I don't care about anything else, okay? I just know that. We need to do that sometimes. And ladies, I don't know who this is for, but ladies, we have to make sure that we don't harden our hearts. You see, especially ladies of our culture who have gone through a lot. We've put up with a lot from history, coming over here, our families being separated from us, us being taught how to be husbands opposed to being wives. We've had to be single parents many times, raise our kids. And I'm gonna tell you something. Sometimes we've had to be single parents inside a home where there was a father and husband who was not doing his job. So with all that, we get a certain callousness around our heart where we don't want to hear nothing from nobody. We got this. But you got to be careful 
because you will carry that when it comes to your relationship with your heavenly father as you're sitting at that banquet table. You cannot afford that. So you need to work on that. Now I'm being totally authentic with you. And you've got to be authentic with yourself because sometimes we don't want to admit those things. We don't want to think about those things. We're just doing what we need to do. We are guarding ourselves. We have to take care of ourselves. No, if you are a daughter of the king, you have got the most high God who's got you. You don't need to have to worry so much about taking care of yourself. You just need to serve him and know that he's got everything taken care of from you. You can soften your heart, receive his love, and receive the love that's available to you. Now again, I don't know who that was for, but praise the Lord. Okay, so anyway, another thing that we decided to do, we decided one time to take our children on a camping trip, because we thought it would be nice. Now, you have to understand, my version of camping is not everybody else's version of camping. Like, I'm not sleeping on no ground in a tent. That's not happening, okay? <laughs> so we had to go to a resort <laughs> campground. I'm just being honest, okay, where it had houses, real houses, not even cabins, houses with stoves, microwaves, all of that, okay? But you still had to pack up your stuff. So you had to take sleeping bags and everything, even though we slept on beds, but you still needed sleep because, of course, I'm not, you know, if they were gonna give us sheets, I don't trust their sheets. So we brought our own sleeping bags, we brought our own food. And it was really a nice place. And it was right next to or near Great Adventure Theme Park, which happens to be in New Jersey. So we figured, okay, great, we'll go to the campground, we'll go over to Great Adventure, you know, we'll come back to the campground. So we did that. We go to Great Adventure, you know, and you stay there all day. Because after you spend that ticket money, you're going to be there all day. So we get in our car to drive back to the campground. And we had a little Aerostar minivan, okay? So we get in the minivan, and here we go. And the transmission said no. <laughs> and the transmission just, whatever they do, it blew, it broke. I don't know. It did not work. And here we are with all of these kids. We look like, it reminded me, I don't know why this, it's no correlation, but this is how my mind goes, so just bear with me. I thought of the Von Trapp family when they're trying to escape out of Austria. We were just trying to get off the side of the road. So here we, we got the kids and stand, and of course I'm in the driver's seat, you know, and let's push this, this, this van. And we're pushing this van, pushing this van, and then we figure, okay, we've got to call because we got to get the van. We can't just leave it here. So we call a tow service who then takes us. We all load back up in the car. He puts it on whatever, the flatbed or whatever, and takes us to the campground. Now, here's the most hysterical part. He takes us to the campground. We were really almost right across the street. We could have just kept pushing. We didn't need to pay for, pay for the tow truck. Well, whatever. We get there. We go to bed. But now... How do we get home? Okay, because we have a busted car. Uh, we have to get home. And we've got the sleeping bags, the food, all of this stuff that we packed up. How do we get home? So Stan being the resourceful man that he is, he calls a business associate, explains the problem, and says, you got to send something to get us all home. So now the kids are, you know, well, what is he going to send? How are we going to get home? Da -da -da -da. You know, you're hearing all thoughts, ideas, and suggestions, okay? So then we realize, okay, our ride is here. Let us see what in the world are we going home in. Here was another wink from God because we all went home in a stretch limousine, okay? The people in the campground, well, who are these people, okay? Who I mean, what is this? Because, you know, campers are like that anyway, okay? But they wanted to know, who is this? So we went home in a stretch limo, as royalty ought to go home, okay? So once again, a wink from God. He took care of us. Now, one of the things I should say, because I didn't tell you this, you can write this down. I'll share it with you really quick. Um... I was standing, and this was funny, when this happened, I was standing on a verse of scripture, even though I truly didn't understand, because I was still a baby Christian, I didn't totally know what it meant to stand. I was just saying this verse, believing God was going to really help us. And it was Psalm 27, verse 14. 
And in the New King James Version, it says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And then in the message, it says, I'm sure now I'll see God's goodness in the exuberant earth. Stay with God, take heart, don't quit. I'll say it again, stay with God. That's what we did. And I had shared that with the children, because remember what I said to you earlier, we started sharing the word with them. Whatever we learned, we shared with them so that they could grow thereby as well. So that was something we were standing on. But I have to admit, I wasn't asking for a stretch limo. I was just trying to get something that was going to work <laughs> to take us back home. But that was a wink to me, totally from God. And I absolutely appreciated it. Now, we left the theme park, all of that seemed fine, all of that was good. Sometimes you need to know that your winks are answers to thoughts or feelings that you may have. Because God does care for you just that much, like I said. Here's something else that happened. When I first started understanding the office of the Holy Spirit, there was still a lot of questions I really had because like I said, I was a baby Christian, and I'm like, okay, I know the Holy Spirit's real. I have it. I read the book. I mean, I get it, but like, I wasn't so clear on exactly what he did. So we went on a crusade. This was one of our first crusades, you know, in the beginning. And at that particular crusade, the ministry had come up with this beautiful brass bookmark that they were giving away to people who came to the crusade. Now, Stan and I were workers, so I didn't think we were entitled to one, you know, and I really wanted one, but I didn't want to say anything. First of all, I was so blessed that they even allowed me to come work there, and I was like, well, I'm not going to ask for it, and we're packing up everything, and they had a box of them left, okay? Now, you see, the enemy would make you think, you got a box of them, just take one. No, I knew that wasn't right. So I just sat there, and I was like, oh, in my heart. I wanted one so bad. Now, we were, say, here in this room, packing this stuff up. Quincy, who will always be a mentor for me, oh, Quincy Watts was working with us, and he said, okay, he was done, he was going back to the hotel. Imagine the hotel being our office, okay? So it's not real far, but it's not exactly in the next room either. He went there, and we're packing everything up, he comes back, he goes, really? And I'm like, what's wrong? He goes over to the box and he goes, here. I said, a bookmark? He goes, why didn't you just tell me you wanted one? I said, how did you know? He said, the Holy Spirit told me, but he told me after I got into the hotel and I had to come all the way back here to give it to you. Is there anything else that you want? I was like, oh my goodness. For me, that was a wink from God, a wink to let me see this is how the Holy Spirit really works. He will even tell you of things to come. He will give you words of knowledge, which is what he did in that instance. He gave Quincy a word of knowledge to let him know, I wanted this bookmark. But that was something, that wink forever changed my life too, because I got to see this is real, this is real. Again, when you're sitting at this banquet table, pay attention to what is being presented and grab a hold of it. Now, another thing, you hear me tell you how we went on these crusades. Okay, well, I'm gonna give you a little background on that. We decided to go on the crusades because, first of all, after I was saved there, that in of itself was a miracle <laughs> to me. So, both of us were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that was a big deal because you got to understand, Stan his whole life was taught that this is of the devil. So for him to step out in faith and receive this gift, you better believe our life was constantly changing as a result. And we were so appreciative. So we knew they needed help because come on, there's always help needed in the ministry of helps. <laughs> okay. So we said, all right, we will go on the crusades. If you, you know, you allow us, you ha we have hands, we can help. We don't have to do anything special. I didn't care. I pick a piece of paper on the floor, didn't matter. I just wanted to be there to help if I could. 
And of course they said yes, they wanted to say no, but we had to foot our own expenses. Now, here we are, I'm a baby, we might as well, I, I can't say Stan wasn't a baby Christian, but I was a baby Christian. And we had to learn how to operate in faith because even though he was born again, he just had become spirit-filled and just had started operating as a believer should. So you might as well have said we were both babies at that time getting things done. And the thought of these crusades, they started adding up because they were having crusades like every month. And we still had a family and a house and children and we know how all that costs money too. So this particular crusade was in Houston, Texas. Now, why this is so important is because our airfare alone was $900. Now, keep this in mind. This is back in like the early 90s, okay? So $900 now, that's still a decent amount. It was a huge amount back then. And it was really huge for a couple who, remember, couldn't afford a 75 cent book not that long ago. So $900 was a big chunk of change, okay? Plus, we still had the hotel bill. That's more money, plus you have to eat, plus we were there for five days. That's almost a week. So even if you try to ration out your food, okay, you still gotta eat. So the point is, this was an expense. So we get the money together, we go. We get there, and a group of people from California are at the airport. Now, they always rented a van. We're staying in the same hotel as them. The thing is, if you rent a van, you don't have to pay for a cab. And the cab was like another, I don't know, 35 or $40. Now keep in mind, we're counting every penny, okay? So we see them, they say hi, they get in the van and they go to the hotel. And we're standing there and we're like, you didn't want to take us, <laughs> okay? Now, this shows you how you can be immature because trust me, we were hurt, okay? I mean, I could stand here and make it sound like we were, we were hurt. And we got back to that hotel, we got in our room, and we talked about it for about a half an hour too. Because we're like, how in the world we spent $900, came all the way out here, they saw us and just left us? Okay, now, they probably, I guarantee you now that I'm more mature, they weren't even thinking about it. They just knew they had the California group that had to go, but, the thoughts, the ideas, and the suggestions. I should almost couple this with that message that we taught on Thursday based upon the Apostles' book, The Mind, The Arena of Faith, because it talks about the thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. Well, we were being buffeted with all the thoughts of the enemy. If we would have kept listening to him, we would have just packed up and went back home. Not really, because we would have had to pay a change fee, and that was more than what, what we really wanted to have to spend. So anyway, we sat there and we're like, okay, and this is why it's good if you have a spouse that's in the word, because you can wash each other with the water of the word. You can bring back to each other's remembrance what the word says. And if you don't have a spouse, you need to find a good trusted friend. Notice I said friend, because friend is a covenant word, not associate, but friend who can hold you accountable so that you can get yourself back on track. So that's what we did. And we realized, you know what? We didn't come here for all of that falderra. We came here to serve the Most High God, and we are going to serve Him with our whole heart. So we left all of those silly feelings. We never allowed ourselves to stoop down to the level of how we felt. But rather, we said, we're here to serve the Lord. That's what we're going to do. And that's what we did. Had a wonderful, wonderful crusade. Had a lot of fun, all of that. Then, when it came time to pay the bill for the hotel, it was over $700. You want to talk about <laughs> really sobering? Because <laughs> it's like, okay. And we literally were sitting there because we were like, well, we probably should just put this on Amex. I mean, we're just thinking about this real life because you know they slip the thing under the door so you know how much it is before you go down there. So we already figured, okay, we're going to put this one on Amex and then we're going to have to believe God how we're going to pay off the Amex because, you know, this is a lot. Because, of course, where does Crenshaw do? It stays in five-star hotels. So it wasn't like we were staying in some little, you know, roadhouse inn. <laughs> so we get down there. And we're happy because we're like, we're just going to put it on Amex. And Mike Evans walks up to us and goes, oh, hi, how you doing? We're like, oh, we're fine, you know, whatever. He goes, okay, so good to see you guys. They paid the bill. 
the ministry picked up that bill. That, for us, was a huge wink from God because now we could take that money and get ready for the next crusade. But do you see how our thinking was? Our thinking wasn't, oh, now we got money, let's go to the mall. No, our thinking was now we can take that. We've got more to serve you with, Father. Thank you. It was a wink from God. See, these winks, here's the thing that you need to really keep in mind. If I wink at you, you had to do what? You had to see my face. If I turn my back, well, you could with this, but you know, if I turn my back and wink, you can't see me. The point is, when you want to see a wink from God, you've got to seek his face. That's what he wants. That's why it's the banquet table. He's sitting there fellowshipping with you. You can see him, but not if you're not willing to come to the table and not come as a guest, but come as a son and daughter. Sometimes you could be in the midst of doing something that other people will ridicule you for. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes folks can tell you how to live your life better than you know how, you know? And they'll sit and talk about you like, well, why are you doing that? You know you should do so and so and so. Why are you taking the money and doing that? That's ridiculous, that's silly. Huh. Like you asked them, you didn't even ask them, okay? Well, I had started a small business that was mine, and one component of the business was Avon. However, I didn't do my Avon business like some people do. I did it where you call me and I ship the stuff. I did not have time to go door to door. I, that was, I didn't camp on the ground. <laughs> I just have a different way of thinking. So my thinking was, I'll just ship stuff places to people. But I realized that I could use Avon as a fundraising vehicle. And I did, I was very successful with that. Um, a lot of different people I helped, but this one group, they had this one group from another Baptist church where they had what they called the Helping Hands Club. That was the name of their club. The president of the club was 93 years old, okay? All of the ladies were seniors, very much so. And there was like maybe, I think it was a half a dozen of them, it wasn't a lot. And I went to their meeting. I will admit what attracted me to the Helping Hands Club was they wanted to create scholarships to send young people to college. And I thought that is just such a wonderful thing that they want to do. So I said to them, fine, I'll run this fundraiser for you. You just hand out the books, we'll, I'll do all the work. You just hand out the books, we'll give it a window of two weeks because that was how I did it. I said, and whatever monies are collected, I won't take anything. I will give, and at that time, because my business had done very well, I had a 50% profit margin on all of the products. So therefore, if they did a fundraiser of $2,000, they got $1,000, okay? And that's when people were telling me how stupid I was, because why are you doing that? You need to be taking the money, all of the rest of this. So I knew I'm just not listening. So I went ahead and I did it. And I was so happy, they invited me to the little banquet they had at the end, and they were able to give scholarships to two students. I was just so blessed by that. I, I, just, I just thought it was so nice that I could help these ladies whose heart, they wanted to do something. They may not have been physically able to do all of the running around and all the stuff that was involved because, I mean, they were in their 90s, come on. But their heart was there, and I was a part of that. I was so blessed. And I'll never forget one of the members saying to me, she said, you know, Iva, she said, you've worked so hard at this and you've done it with such joy. She said, God is gonna honor what you've done. She said, I don't know how. She said, but I want you to know he's gonna honor it. And I said, well, you know what? I received that and I thank you for it. Now, I had no idea, because I, I, I wasn't doing it except for to help them. Well, a year later, Argerita, Dr. Argerita that you see come here, she was in her freshman year and anyway, this particular school, the second semester, she was in Bethune-Cookman. And she became part of the concert chorale. She was playing her flute, blah, blah, blah. Here was the bottom line. We took her there, believing we're paying tuition and you know all the rest of that. 
we didn't have to pay a dime. They saw her talent and they said, you know what? We didn't even have to buy a pencil. They paid for everything. All of the time she was there. But here's the other thing. It wasn't just there. All of the time she went all the way through her doctorate, she had scholarship. Not, she took out whatever the initial little bit of loans you have to take out. You know, the government, you get $1,500 or whatever it is. She did that because they kind of required that. But everything else was paid for all the way through. And she went to a lot of schools. But all of that was paid for. But here's what I want you to see. Here's where the wink came from. The seed that was planted at the Helping Hands Club. The running around and all that was done with the chatter of this is stupid, you shouldn't do it. That service, it happened at the Helping Hands Club. So all I'm saying to you is God sees your heart. He knows what you're about. He knows what your thoughts are. This is another little thing. It wasn't even in here, but I'm going to share it with you. We used to go to this big, prominent ministry. Um, I'll just say it was in Nanuet. If I say that, you'll know where it was, for those who know. Anyway, at the time we were going, I had four children. My fifth child wasn't born. And we were going there, and all of these people, they had learned the word of faith, and they were very prosperous, praise God. You go to the parking lot, and you know, you saw all of the wonderful uh, Mercedes and everything. You saw all of that stuff, BMWs, you know, and then our little car. <laughs> anyway, you saw all of this. And the winter time, they rolled out with the coats. I mean, minks from every minks and sables and all of these fur coats. And they looked like the royalty they should be. I never begrudged that. I thought, wow, I was trying to grow up and maybe get to that point. I, on the other hand, would go and I had, a, I guess you could call it a cardigan sweater. It was a nice heavy one. But that's what I wore, because I wanted my girls to have on Rothschild coats, because they weren't going to go looking so-so. I wanted them looking good. But I didn't need it so much. Well, I'll never forget standing in the lobby one day, and it was a huge lobby, because this church had every Sunday about 3,500 people. And they all stood there looking gorgeous with their diamonds and all that stuff. And here I am, I felt good. I have beautiful children, they looked wonderful. My husband looked good. I was trying to be the Proverbs 31 woman who my family, that showed what I was doing. Well, I then heard these ladies chatting about how feeble I looked, how horrible I looked, how, how could she come out wearing that torn up looking sweater? And look at how her kids look. Look at how her husband looks. Oh, she just looks like a mess. And the sad part about this was I had only been saved for about a year. So it hurt. Now if I hear it, I'm like, okay, I'll just pray for you. You know, I understand. But I was really hurt. And I remember going home and I had this one chair that I used to love to sit in in my living room. It was like my prayer chair. That's how I looked at it. It was this big chair. I put the kids out to school. Stan would be out to work. That was my time to sit with the Lord. And I just sat there and I cried. And I said, you know, Father, I'm not even asking for a fur coat. I just don't want them to just think I'm nothing because I don't have one. Just allow them to maybe see my heart and not see that I don't have all of this stuff. But I love you. Isn't that enough? That's all I said. I never asked him for a fur coat. Well, and I never said this to Stan. I wasn't going to burden him with this. Are you kidding? So he had a, we used to belong to part of a, a barter exchange. That's a whole nother long story. I don't have time to go into it. But here's the thing. On the barter exchange, there happened to be a furrier in Glen Cove, which is a very nice exclusive area on Long Island. So I never talked to Stan about this, but one day he said, come on, let's go out to lunch. I'm like, okay, and I'm thinking in my mind, thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. We're going out to lunch, what's wrong, <laughs> okay? He takes me to the farrier, and I go in, and I'm looking around, and the, you know, you think of things that they tell you as a child, like you don't want to get in there and act like you've never been there before. Don't go in there, you know, you know? So I'm 
I'm going to go in there and I'm going to act like I know what, and I'm standing there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. And the guy looks at me and he says, uh, no. He said, I, this stuff is okay. I'm like, okay, I think it's amazing. He said, I've got something just for you. And he goes in the back and brings out this full length brown swakara fur coat with sleeves that are done in sheared beaver. It looked like, I, I can't even begin to explain it to you. And he said, try it on. I tried it on, didn't need alterations, didn't need anything. It was perfect. That was a wink from God that allowed me to see he knows my heart. I didn't ask for this, but he saw my tears. He knew how I felt. He cared enough about me to give me this. And it didn't hurt my husband because it was a barter deal. So it wasn't taking any, you know, like money or funds from our household. Yeah, he had to work it off or whatever he had to do, but it was not, it was a good deal is the point. All I'm saying is God loved me that much. And for me, I was like, oh, that's why I call these things winks from God. Because it's not like, you know, a big rumbling earthquake happened. But the point is, he knew my heart. Only he knew it. I hadn't voiced it to anybody else. I hadn't given it life. But it was in my heart. And he did it just for me. Oh, and I am so out of time. Anyway, the point being is, the same way he did it just for me, he's no respecter of persons. I want you to leave here today and I want you to go home and I want you to start thinking about and cataloging the winks that you've received in your life. And then just be grateful and make sure that you figure out a way, you plan on taking a seat at his table so that you can expect even more. And we'll have to pick up from here because I really have run out of time. Praise God. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We now offer the convenience of text and online giving, one of the most secure ways to give. Try it now. Simply text East G from your smartphone to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, or East O for offering. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, BrentshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This experience is easy to use, secure, and requires a one-time registration only. Giving the second time is even easier. Simply text East G to 28950 with all your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return in your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight.